Our final scripture for this morning comes from the book of Acts. These events describe what takes place shortly after Pentecost, after the dramatic events of that day have occurred, and then Peter has preached and made many converts. Then we continue with our reading for today. Listen for what God may speak to us this day. So those who welcomed Peter's message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have a a vivid memory of something that took place in worship in a church that I previously served. That particular sanctuary was a little different than this one. It was a little longer and narrower. Uh, Like this sanctuary, it had a narthex right as you went out the back doors, but It also had a fellowship area, a large fellowship area, just on the other side of that narthex, and you could just go straight through into the narthex. But more importantly, at least for this story, the back wall of that sanctuary had windows that ran all the way across. And so the choir and I could look out into the narthex and some on into that fellowship area during the worship service. This was very distracting uh, for me. There were always a few ushers that stayed in the narthex, and they were often scurrying around, going to get a cup of coffee, looking for the offering plates, um, moving the furniture around in the fellowship area to get it ready for when people came out. I tried very hard to ignore them. One day as I was preaching, I saw a man who looked like he might be homeless appear from the left side from the entranceway that was just out of my view and head into the narthex. He didn't make it very far before he was intercepted by one of those ushers. Now, I could see what was happening, but of course couldn't hear anything. The usher appeared to approach him cordially and probably ask him if he could do anything to help him. I'm assuming that the man said he was looking for some help and that the usher said it probably wasn't the best time because right after that he led the man gently but firmly back across the narthex and out of my view back towards where that exit was. I don't know if the people in the congregation noticed my distraction. I kept preaching, but my attention was really focused on the other side of those windows. And that moment has stayed with me. And I've wondered about it from time to time. I wondered, did the usher perhaps invite him to stay for worship? Did the man volunteer that he'd come back later when he found out that worship it was just barely getting started and it would be a while. I really don't know. Still, the contrasts were rather stark. The usher was in a coat and tie. The man was in ragged, rather disheveled clothes. The usher and pretty much everybody in the sanctuary was white. The man was black. Clearly, he wasn't one of us. He wasn't like us, and he didn't stay very long. 
watching those events in the narthex, it was easy to imagine that this usher was reinforcing the racial and economic barriers of our society. But I really don't think that he was. He just was trying to maintain a certain sense of decorum and order for worship. I know that he supported the ministry where homeless families lived in our church building for a week at a time, eight different weeks over the course of the year. It's just that he saw worship and mission as two relatively separate things. And in that sense, I don't know that he's really that different from me. Seeing how I came to ministry as a second career, I remember those days when my wife and I hunted for a church to join. And when we did, we looked for people who were like us, who sang songs that we liked and worshipped in a style that was familiar to us. And when we joined a church, the people there looked like us and dressed pretty much like us and by and large were the same skin color as us. When we were looking for a church, we didn't think of it as having to do much with breaking down barriers of culture and race and economics. We were just looking for a comfortable place to attend. In the constitutional documents of our denomination, the last of what are called the six great ends of the church is the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. And in those documents section on worship, it says this, in its worship and ministry, the church is a sign of the reign of God. You know, the reign of God, that day when everybody will sing hymns that I like and everyone will agree with my political leanings and everyone will agree with my biblical interpretation. You know, you can't really worship without a style. You have to do it some way. And I don't suppose until Jesus returns there's any way to know which style he prefers. But it seems likely that it's a style that reaches out, that crosses boundaries and barriers the same way that Jesus did, that draws in the outsider. Sixty years ago, when we could almost safely assume that everyone was Christian, nearly everyone, it was easy to forget that our worship was part of our ministry, part of the way that we proclaimed Christ and God's new day. In those days, it didn't matter that much if someone did or didn't like our particular style of worship. But in a day when no one has to go to church, if someone decides to give church a try and they feel that they're not welcome or they don't belong there, they may well never try the next church down the street. In our day, worship is a profound opportunity to share God's love, to show people that new day that God proclaimed in Christ and called us to be a part of. And there's a a, a paragraph in the chapter in Brian McLaren's book that we're using for today's worship that I think really speaks to this new day that the church is supposed to be a part of. Uh, in the book, in this chapter, McLaren is imagining that he is a member of the Jerusalem church in the first year of its existence. And he describes it this way. He says, it is so unlike anything any of us have ever experienced. Everywhere in our society, we experience constant divisions between rich and poor, slave and free, male and female, Jew and Greek, city-born and country-born, and so on. But at the Lord's table, 
just as it was when Jesus shared a table with sinners and outcasts. We are all one, all loved, all welcome as equals. We even greet one another with a holy kiss. No one would ever see a high-born person greeting a slave as an equal, except at our gatherings, where those social divisions are being forgotten and where we learn new ways of honoring one another as members of one family. Maybe you've never thought about it, but, but church congregations are strange, even countercultural places. They're one of the only places, or one of the few places, where parents and children, students, the very young and the very old, the very wealthy and the not wealthy at all, gather in one place as one community, gather together for a shared experience as that community. Here, all are welcome. But because we don't think about it a lot, it's easy to forget that this welcome is a part of our ministry, our mission, our work together to proclaim God's new day. And like other mission and ministry, it requires some, some thought and some intentionality. So how do we ensure that our worship is as welcoming as it could be? How do we work so that people who encounter our worship have an experience like the one I just read from Brian McLaren, where he says, it's so unlike anything any of us have ever experienced. Everywhere in our society, we experience constant divisions, and surely we can resonate with that. But here, we all are one, all loved, all welcome as equals. And this is a ministry that we all share, ensuring that all are welcomed, loved, and equal, whether they are like us or whether they are not, whether, whether they are Democrats or Republicans or something else whether they are well-versed in how people do church or whether they know nothing about it, whether they have the same taste and style preferences as us or they do not. Because there is no us and them in Christ. What brings you to worship this Sunday or any Sunday? Assuming someone isn't forcing you to be here, what is it that draws you to this place? There are probably lots of reasons. More than one may apply to you. Habit, faithful duty, a desire to connect with God, spiritual hunger or longing, wanting to give thanks or sing praises, and many, many more. When I hear people compliment worship or complain about it, very often the issue is what they did or didn't get out of that worship. Did it move me? Did it inspire me? Did it feed me? Nothing wrong with that. Encountering God in worship is a wonderful thing. To, to be swept up in God's love, to recognize that God longs for you no matter who you are, that, that God 
wants you to know life in all its fullness is something to be greatly desired. But to be caught up in that divine embrace is also to be changed, transformed into people, overwhelming with gratitude, longing to share God's love with others. And when we do encounter God's love, say our thanks, welcome all, and embrace one another in that love, then we have truly worshipped. And our worship truly becomes our ministry. All praise and glory to the God whose love takes shape in Jesus and comes to us. Thanks be to God.